Thank you. What a perfect song to end this morning, this musical worship on. This morning, we are going to look at how great our God is. It seems like a lifetime ago when I began my sermon series on the book of Jude. You may not remember that long ago, but that was the first Sunday that we did not meet due to COVID-19. Well, we'll be starting back on that series in Jude uh, later this year. But today we're going to be looking at a passage in the book of Colossians, specifically Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23, regarding the preeminence of Christ. Webster defines preeminence as the fact of surpassing all others, or simply supremacy. When we are finished today, my prayer is that there will be no doubt that Christ indeed surpasses all others, that he is superior over all creation, that in any time of trouble or concern that we would return to this passage of Scripture to preach the gospel to ourselves and remind us of who Christ is and who we are in him. Jesus Christ is indeed enough for every trial that we face in this life. He is all we need. And one day, he will be all that we want. When Paul wrote this short letter in the early 60s of the first century, his first concern was to ensure that his readers grasped the full significance of what they had come to believe. Also, that they would not be deceived about what they believed. Paul had heard of their faith and their love, and he knew that our faith is always under attack. He had a thorough knowledge, Paul did, of the world in which he and the Colossians lived. And aware of these general and ever-present challenges to the Christian faith, Paul wrote this letter to that church that met in Philemon's house in Colossae. Aware, the letter has now, that went to that church, has come down through the New Testament to us. And it has gone through the whole world. In our passage today, we come to the heart of this letter, this short letter to the church that met in Colossae. If we hear carefully and understand clearly and believe firmly what the Apostle has written here, we will be equipped for every threat, for every challenge that life might bring against us as believers. That is a bold claim, but it is completely warranted by this remarkable passage of Scripture. Verses 15 through 20 comprise the second half of one long sentence that begins way back in in verse 9. The connection of what precedes what we are looking at today should not be lost. And here Paul speaks of one in whom we have redemption, in verse 14, into whose kingdom the Father has transferred us. We have been transferred 
out of the domain of darkness into the kingdom of light, verse 13. This is why Paul prayed that his readers would be joyful in giving thanks to the Father in verse 12. And this is God's will, which Paul was praying, that they would know fully in verse 9. It is within that context that Paul wrote these words. And I ask you to follow along on the screen or in your Bibles this morning as we read our text of Scripture. Starting at verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he may be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and without reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. That is the word of the Lord this morning. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for your word, your holy word. I pray that you would bless this morning. I pray that you would hide me behind your cross, that you would have the preeminence. Lord, I pray that your word will not go forth void, that our family would be constantly reminded that we need to preach the gospel to ourselves every day. Lord, I pray that this passage of Scripture will be that message that we return to time and time again when it seems like the world is overtaking us. I pray these things in, your, in our precious Savior's name. Amen. I want to tell you that exegeting God's word, which is simply the pulling out of the meaning of a text, can be overwhelming. Even more so when I study a passage like we're looking at today. These true words in Scripture remind me how small I am. And how great Jesus Christ is. Let's spend just a moment here thinking in general terms about this amazing passage of Scripture before we come to what it says in detail. The very fact that these words about our Savior, Jesus Christ, were written in A.D. 60-ish something is astounding that these extraordinary and extravagant things could be said about a man who soon after, so soon after he had died in the most humiliating, shameful, indeed disgraceful circumstances, cries out for some explanation. These words were written 30 years after Christ was crucified. 
That explanation is found in the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But even then, these words are breathtaking. These words, if their claim is taking, taken seriously, are overwhelming. These lines of Paul's letter are so striking that they have often attracted the attention of biblical scholars, some of whom have been so dazzled by this passage that they have lost sight of what these words are there for. This is a little odd because it's a safe assumption that the first half of the sentence that runs from verse 9 through verse 20 has something to do with why the second half is there. It is therefore worth noticing that verses 15 through 20 belongs to Paul's report of Paul praying for the church in Colossae. What he says in verses 15 through 20, in other words, is relating to what Paul was praying for. In particular, that his readers will be giving thanks to the Father. And also, that they may be filled with the knowledge of God's will for the future. If we press the question and ask, what it was that called for such a big statement about Christ here at this point in this letter to these believers in Colossae, I take it that the answer lies in Paul's purpose in the long introduction. If you have been in the Colossians class, you'll know that Unlike most of Paul's introductions, the introduction to Colossians goes from chapter 1, verse 3, all the way through to chapter 2, verse 5. Almost a full third of this letter is introduction. I have suggested that there Paul was putting before those Colossian believers the astonishing significance of their faith in Jesus Christ. God has acted so that the nations, uh, Gentile believers, uh, those there in Colossae, those around the world, were actually no longer dogs, but they were qualified to share in the inheritance of God's people, the Jews. How is it that Greeks and barbarians and Scythians, indeed every people on the face of the earth, can be now qualified to share in the inheritance of God's people? How is it, in other words, that the message that Epaphras brought to his friends there in Colossae was bearing fruit and growing through the entire world. Trust me, after 2,000 years since this letter has been written, it is too easy for us to take this marvel for granted. We may not understand how utterly significant that it was that outsiders from the Jewish believers were now considered part of God's chosen people. We, we refer to Christianity as a world religion, but we have to put ourselves back into the church pew, the seats meeting in Philemon's house, in order to understand the remarkability of this text. In a sense, what we consider a world religion was not in A.D. 60. It was little more than perhaps an energetic Jewish sect, apparently attracting some attention from some of those dogs, those, those dirty, filthy rags of barbarians and Scythians, non-Jewish people 
in just some places around the Mediterranean world. And that would have been a fair description of the phenomenon that it seemed. We need to recognize that the claim made by Paul in this letter is as astounding today as it was on that day when this letter was read in that church gathering. The light has dawned for the whole world. The news about Jesus, the word of the truth, the gospel, is now the most important force in the entire world. The Creator intended the human race to be fruitful and multiply. Now His purpose for the whole human race is being realized as the gospel of Christ is bearing fruit throughout the world. The time has come in the sorry history of the world for the darkness to give way to light, for hostility to give way to peace, for ignorance to give way to knowledge, for evil to give way to good, for lies to give way to truth, for foolishness to give way to wisdom. Everywhere, in every nation, in every city, in every village, in every town, in every county, in the whole world. That is what's happening. These preliminaries are no more than that. Our initial observation. About a year ago, we went through a course in hermeneutics here at Marquette Community Church. And you may be saying to yourself right now, Herman who? And that would be correct. That's the name of the course. The course's name was Herman who? In that class, we learned that there are four steps to proper biblical exegesis. Bringing that meaning out of the original text. If you remember, they are observation, interpretation, principalization, and application. Aware of the context and observing its structure, now it is time to listen carefully what is said in this extraordinary passage. He is the image of the invisible God. On the one hand, this means that God, whom no one can see, was visibly represented in Jesus Christ. It was not simply that Jesus taught about God. Jesus was the exact image of God. He was the visible tangible representation of God. As Jesus said in John 14, 9, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. On the other hand, we must remember that the image of God is what we, mankind, was created to be. Genesis 1.27 tells us, In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Human beings have had a long history of falling short of what we were intended to be. But, without qualification and without exaggeration whatsoever, Paul can say of Jesus that he is the image of God. He is the exact representation of God and the perfect realization of humanity. The image of the invisible God. Jesus is the exegesis of who God is. And what I mean by that is this. I'm going to steal this from the author of Hebrews. 
In these last days, God has spoken to us by his Son, whom God appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he, Jesus, upholds the universe by the word of his power. Do you hear a parallel there between the Hebrews and the Colossians passage? I said the author of Hebrews. I say that because we do not know specifically who wrote the book of Hebrews. But I'll give you my two cents. I believe that Hebrews is a sermon that Paul delivered. And it's not being recorded. It wasn't recorded. It wasn't going out on YouTube. It wasn't going to be posted on a podcast. So somebody sitting in the audience was recording what Paul was saying. So it was preached by Paul, recorded by someone else, and you can disagree with me, that's fine. There's been a lot of debate over the years, and that's free. And you can feel free to disregard that, but let's get back to Colossians. More than that, Paul continues, he is the firstborn of all creation. It would not have been inappropriate to describe Adam as the firstborn of all creation. Not, of course, in the sense that he was the first created thing. He was not. Adam was not the first created thing. According to Genesis, Adam was the culmination of creation. Genesis 1 emphasizes the priority of mankind in that they were to have dominion over all things. All things were created in an important sense for the benefit of mankind. We might say that all creation was given to mankind as his inheritance. The word firstborn has this sense of priority, not necessarily referring to time, but more specifically to status and rank, perhaps with the connotations of inheritance. In due course, God's chosen people, Israel, were called God's firstborn. Again, this spoke of their privileged position among the nations. It had to do with Israel's priority, not so much in time as in status. It implied an inheritance. In Psalm 89, God promised to Israel's king, and it was expressed like this. Psalm 89, 27, I will make him the firstborn, the highest kings of the earth. Well, the Arians of the fourth century, just like the Jehovah's Witnesses today, take Colossians 1, 15 out of context, and they use this to indicate that the Son of God was a created being. They are guilty of ignoring the context of the passage. Verse 15 tells us who Christ is. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And that is supported by verse 16, which is an explanation of why he is properly so described. Beginning with the words, For by him all things were created. All creation is profoundly related to Christ. And if Christ is clearly distinguished here from all created things, this is the part of the context that the Jehovah's Witnesses ignore. Because if all things were created by Jesus Christ, then clearly he is not Included in those things created. 
There is nothing in creation that is independent of Jesus Christ. As though to make sure that we understand the phrase, all things, Paul emphasizes that there are no limits to what is included. In heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, not just the things that we're aware of, but the things that are beyond our senses, the things that are beyond our knowledge. The coronavirus, the, the novel coronavirus, that new coronavirus that we're all sick of hearing, so should I say it one more time? Is not new to Jesus Christ. He created it. He is in control of it. And all things includes all the powers that exercise any influence anywhere. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. Paul's purpose is to make sure that we understand that by all things, he means all things. All things were created by him. He has control over all things. Even Governor Evers. Even Jamie Sofa. All things were created through him and for him. All things were created by God in him, through him, and for him. In him indicates that all things were created within Christ's sphere of influence, so to speak. Through him means that he was God's powerful agent in creation. He was the word by which God created all things. He was the wisdom of God that accomplished creation in all things. For him says that the purpose and goal of all things lies in their relation to Jesus. Here is the ultimate unity of everything. This is not a piece of abstract philosophy. Paul is speaking astonishingly of the one who had just 30 years earlier been executed on a cross in Jerusalem. But he wasn't just crucified. He just wasn't killed. He gave himself. And three days later, Jesus Christ rose from the grave. And he appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus. This is what he is saying about him. Paul saying this. All things have their origin, existence, and purpose in Christ. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. There is something radically bigger here than any theory of intelligent design. The man who was crucified 30 years before these words were written is said to be prior to created existence, both in the temporal sense, but more importantly, in his supremacy. The universe and whatever else existed owes its being continuation and coherence to Jesus Christ. And he is the head of the body, the church. From his eternal priority to all things, his unique role in the origin of all things and his supreme position in the integration of all things and their final de de destiny, we turn to the fact that he is the head of this thing that is called the church. We could go down a rabbit hole about German influence and why this word has been translated church. It comes from the German Kirche. But we won't. The word usually translated church in English means quite simply an assembly or a gathering of people. Do not forsake the assembly of yourselves together, right? We are gathered here. The first half of the passage could have led us to expect something like, Jesus is the head of the universe. Or Jesus is the head of everything. 
head would be a fitting metaphor for what has been said already about Christ. But that's not what it says. The body of which Jesus Christ is the head of is the assembly. The group of believers gathered there in Philemon's house in 62, 3 AD, listening to this letter read to them by Tychicus. It is also us gathered right here today in this very spot. We are the church. We are the assembly. Right now, Christ is our head. He is in the beginning. He is, he is the beginning. He is not only the beginning of all things. He is the new beginning. The one who is the firstborn of all creation. We are now told is the firstborn from the dead. Not only is he prior to all things in every sense. He has been raised from the dead in order that in everything he might be preeminent. There's clearly something unsaid there. The second half of our passage presupposes a problem, a disruption in the universe, a disruption in the totality of all things. A few lines before this passage started, Paul spoke of that domain of darkness in verse 13. And then in in verse 14, he spoke of the forgiveness of sins. In other words, while Christ is the supreme one in whom all things have their origin, on whom all things depend for their very existence, and to whom all things move, he is now the head of all things, as he ought to be. All powers do not presently recognize his preeminence. Congress does not represent recognize Christ's preeminence. The world does not recognize Christ's preeminence. There is sin. There is darkness. There is death in this world. But I promise you this, that will change. By Christ's resurrection from the dead, he is the new beginning And the purpose of this new beginning is that he will become what in fact he is. First, in every sense. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him to reconcile to himself all things. We come to the climax of this extraordinary passage. Why is it that Jesus' resurrection from the dead makes him the new beginning? It is explained by reference to the purpose of his death. Indeed, the purpose of the creation of all things comes together in the crucifixion and death of our Lord Jesus Christ. The three phrases that we saw back in verse 16 appear again here, moving forward in verse 19. In him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Through him, all things were reconciled to him. In the death of Jesus, God was doing something fully comparable to the creation of the world. It was as big as that. It was as important as that. And it was as purposeful as creation. Colossians 1.19 says that all the fullness was pleased to dwell in Jesus. It was God's pleasure and delight that this should be so. That all things... Again, filled out as in verse 16, whether in heaven or in earth, might be reconciled through him and to him. The great disturbance in the unity and harmony of all things has been mended through Christ's sacrificial death. 
making peace by the blood of his cross. The rebellion has been put down. The hostilities have been brought to an end. Peace has been made. With the simple but emphatic words, and you, Paul moves from the subject of Christ and all things in the heavens and on earth, his preeminent role in the creation of all things, and his decisive role in the reconciliation of all things, he now turns to the small group of believers, the church, the assembly. Specifically those gathered in Philemon's house to hear this letter. And you, he says, let us see your lives in the light of Christ. And about this Jesus that we have heard so much. With brilliant brevity, Paul proceeds to show them and us our past lives our present circumstances, and our certain future. All of this is only possible because of the brilliant light of Christ's finished work on the cross. And you, who were once alienated Alienated being the situation of an alien, a stranger, one who does not fit in. It's not a positive experience. Perhaps you've known the experience of alienation. The alienation that Paul speaks of here is deep and terrible. It was clearly implied, though not explicitly stated a few lines earlier, the whole creation... The totality of all things has become alienated from Christ. The one, in whom, the one in whom, through whom, and for whom all things were created and are held together. You also, Paul now says, were once alienated from the one on whom you depend for your very existence. In whom is the meaning and purpose of your life. There could be no deeper alienation than this. And in, and hostile in mind. That is, enemy in your thoughts, attitudes, intentions. The alienation that characterized our past life was not external to us as persons. It was not that we were passively caught up in some cosmic situation beyond our control, though that was true. But in that condition, our own attitudes and thinking were hostile to Christ. We were God-haters. The world is God-haters. And therefore, to God, we, hate, we hated Christ prior to conversion. The world hates Christ. And Paul is reminding his readers gathered here that that is who you once were. The third element of Paul's description of our past life is how this alienation and hostility of mind was expressed in doing evil deeds. Again, a stark contrast between what we were and who we are in Christ. The alienation and the hostility of mind was naturally expressed in behavior. It always is. From the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It, the whole point of appreciating how lost I once was is to realize the wonder of being found. And in verse 22, Paul moves from the past to the present. Corresponding to the once of verse 21, verse 22 begins literally 
but now. This is a striking, distinctive New Testament way of speaking. What has happened in Jesus Christ means that there is a dramatic contrast between once and now. He has now reconciled. What has happened is captured in one word, corresponding to and in contrast with the alienated of our past. In the present, we are reconciled. Paul is picking up the very word he used back at verse 20. In Christ, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile all things to him. God has acted in Jesus Christ to put the universe back together, to overcome the alienation, to bring peace where hostility had arisen, to bring good where evil had taken hold. In other words, God has acted to bring all things back to Christ, back to submission to Jesus, back to honor him, back to have peace with him. And you, what matters for you in the present is that the past is the past. Your present life is now determined by this reconciliation. No longer alienated, but reconciled. If we follow through on the parallels between verse 21 and 22, the the once, now, the alienated, reconciled, we might notice that the once alienated life was consummated in evil works while our now reconciled life is in his body of flesh by his death. Nevertheless, our reconciliation accomplished then is not the end of the story. In addition, it has a purpose yet to be realized. And Paul now, Paul now points to a future occasion when those who have been reconciled in the body of Christ's flesh are to be presented before him in order to present you before him. The future occasion here is judgment. The divine court when each of us will be brought, presented before the judge. Here is the astonishing truth. The death of Jesus on the cross had in view the day of judgment. What Jesus accomplished for us in his death was in order to determine what will happen on that day of judgment. What will happen on that day because of Jesus' death is that you, believer, will be presented before him, holy and blameless and, with a, and above reproach. There is a hint here of the word, world of sacrifice, When sacrifices were presented before the Lord, they were required to be without blemish. But the key wording here is above reproach. It means free from accusation. In other words, innocent. Another word would be justified. The wording is peculiar to this passage, but the truth should be wonderfully familiar to each and every one of us who belong to Jesus Christ. Christ's death was the death of the holy and blameless one who was above reproach. Those words perfectly describe Jesus. Because of his death, we who were once alienated, hostile in mind, and doing evil deeds are now reconciled. So that we, we will be presented before him holy and blameless and above reproach. What God was pleased to do in Christ's body of flesh by his death has consequences for the whole world. Its meaning and purpose, it is our meaning and our purpose. You want to know what the meaning and purpose of life is? It is Jesus Christ. Those of us who were once alienated now are reconciled and then we will be presented before him blameless. Once alienated, currently reconciled, and in the future presented before him holy 
holy and blameless, above reproach. Even if you don't feel like it, that is who you are in Christ. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, Paul continues, the sovereign grace of God on which everything depends does not obliterate human responsibility. We could translate those words in verse 23, since indeed you are continuing in the faith, stable and steadfast. But that does not take away from the fact that persisting in the faith and being established and firm are essential. Do not imagine that a person who abandons their faith in Jesus Christ will be presented holy and blameless. The same point is now put negatively, not shifting from the hope of the gospel. Paul has already emphasized that the gospel that they had believed is the truth. The word of the truth, he called it in verse 5. In this gospel, they had heard of the hope laid up for them in heaven. That hope included the prospect of being presented before the heavenly judge, holy, blameless, and above reproach. There is nothing more important for you than not shifting from the hope of the gospel. Paul says three vitally important things about the gospel. First, it is a gospel that you heard. It is the message that was spoken to you uh, by ordinary men. The gospel that was expressed to you in words that you could understand. It has come to you by the ordinary means of human speech. It is very important to understand that the gospel is not some kind of mystical experience. It is not an unknowable idea. It is the gospel that you heard. Second, we should nonetheless understand that it is an utterly extraordinary gospel. Paul says, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven. This is what Paul had said earlier where he spoke of the gospel, which has come to you as indeed in the whole world. It is bearing fruit and growing. This gospel that you heard is God's word to the whole world. Indeed, the whole of creation. The one in whom you have come to believe when you first heard this gospel is, remember, the one in whom, through whom, and for whom all things, including you, have been created and have your existence. The one in whose death you have been reconciled is the one who has reconciled all all things to himself, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. The first words of this letter introduce Paul as an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. The significance of that self-designation now begins to unfold. The gospel you heard from Epaphras, he says, is the gospel for the whole of creation. And it is the gospel that I, along with you and everyone in ministry, everyone in the body of Christ is to take up. He has already described Epaphras as a faithful servant. But the point to be clear about here is this. The gospel, which Paul has said such extraordinary things about, is the gospel which Paul was a servant too. It is this gospel that will establish you. It is this gospel that will make your faith stable. It is this gospel that gives you, as a believer, unfailing hope. This gospel will therefore bring you to that day when you will be presented before him holy and spotless and blameless. This is who we are in Christ. Paul said it this way, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Romans 12.2 Martin Luther said it this way, we must preach the gospel to ourselves every day because we forget it every day. And 
Paul Tripp, says that we can never stop preaching the gospel to ourselves because we listen to ourselves more than we listen to anybody else in the world. I encourage you to turn to this passage often. Jesus is greater than anything we face. He has already secured the victory. The victory is ours. We have been reconciled to him through his blood of the cross. And we will be presented before him holy and blameless and above reproach. This is the truth in spite of our feelings. Saturate your minds on Christ. Saturate your minds on who he is, what he has done, and who we are in him. This is how we have peace in a world of chaos. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the time that we've had to spend together in your word. I pray that it was profitable. Lord, I thank you for those gathered, those online. I pray that they would realize their position in Jesus Christ. The victory is ours. Let us not be overwhelmed by the world, but turn to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And let us preach it to ourselves every day. I pray these things in our Savior's name and for his glory alone. Amen. Thank you. Have a great week.